Hi everyone, Miss Griff is here with a cold today, sorry. We'll be looking at the influence of some of Henry's wives today. As always, pause, rewind and make some revision notes as you go. It's important to understand and remember when looking at Henry VIII how court factions were significant. When we talk of courts, we aren't just speaking of Henry's home. This was the place where law and great decisions were made. A cousin of the king might be an important princess, but she would also be a lady in waiting or maid to the queen and hold great influence. In the court, there were different groups and families, all trying to get Henry's attention and to have the most influence over him. The Blinns, headed by the Duke of Norfolk, and the Seamers were two of the biggest factions. One of the best ways to get Henry's attention was to have a pretty female faction member to impress him with. The Boleyns were very good at this. In fact, before Anne, her sister Mary had been one of Henry's mistresses. He did have a lot of these. The big difference was that Anne refused to sleep with Henry unless they were married, and this drove Henry wild. Women didn't refuse the king. She would even send gifts back to him that he'd given her. Henry fought to marry Anne Boleyn for six years. He first started seeking his annulment to Catherine of Aragon in 1547, so it shows us he certainly loved her. It didn't last, though. Just three years after the annulment of 1533, Anne is beheaded and her daughter announced as illegitimate. So what went wrong? Henry had an accident whilst jousting. He was unconscious and although he survived, it made him question how long he'd lived for and he still didn't have a male heir. Anne had delivered a daughter but struggled with a boy, miscarrying twice, the last in 1536, the same year that she dies. Henry began to question why he couldn't have a boy. He thought it must have come from God. Perhaps his marriage to Catherine was right in the eyes of God all along. Anne was not conforming to the ideas of a good wife held at the time. She was smart and quite bossy. Things Henry used to find attractive now annoyed him. In fact, it wasn't only Henry. Even Anne's own uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, was said to be getting tired of her. The Seymours were more conservative, less parties and arguments, and more conversations and learning. They introduced Henry to Jane, a homely, sweet and pretty girl who caught his eye. Anne loved court gossip and encouraged it. Odd that this led to her downfall, really. The gossip started talking about her and a rumour that she'd had an affair reached Henry. He took the rumour seriously and set Cromwell the task of investigating the accusations on the 24th of April, 1536. There were five men accused of having an affair with Anne. Five! The first was Mark Smeaton, a 23-year-old court musician. He was the pop star of the times, the man all the girls fancied, and Anne enjoyed flirting with him. Who wouldn't? Under questioning, and probably tortured by Cromwell, he confessed to the affair. But this isn't very reliable, as prisoners are known to confess to anything just to get the torture to stop. The other four men were all nobilities, so they couldn't be tortured, and all of them, even at the last moments of life, denied relations with Anne. These, to me, are a bit harder to believe, as they included a 54-year-old Sir Henry Norris, the groom of the stool, Sir William Brereton, a 48-year-old powerful lord, Sir Francis Weston, a good friend of Henry's, and Anne's own brother, George Boleyn. Ew. Cromwell tried to find evidence that Anne had been betrothed before, but there wasn't any, so instead pursued the adultery and treason accusations. Most of the evidence came from unreliable court gossip, but it was enough. On the 17th of May, her marriage was annulled, and on the 19th of May, she was executed at the Tower of London in front of a thousand spectators. Now, some historians think that Cromwell was more than just Henry's investigator, and that he actually was the one who wanted to get rid of Anne. These historians believe that Anne and Cromwell had different views on important matters like money from the dissolution. She wanted it spent on charity, while Cromwell wanted it for the crown to spend. Anne wanted to ally with France, while he wanted the Habsburg Empire. Perhaps he wanted Anne's influence out of the way to manipulate Henry himself. But other historians say this isn't true. That Henry was mature and powerful now and he couldn't be pushed around anymore. They also agreed on a lot of things, especially Protestantism and reform in the church. These historians think he was just doing what Henry wanted. So, were the Seymours successful? Yes, very. The same day as Anne's execution, he visited Jane at home. The next day he proposed to her, and on the 30th of May, 1536, just 11 days after Anne's death, he married Jane. Henry was still desperate to have a boy. By annulling his last two managers, he's made both daughters, Mary and Elizabeth, illegitimate. He has no heir. Henry did have a son, Henry Fitzroy, 
which literally means he's named son of the king. He was born to Henry's mistress, Elizabeth Blunt. He'd been made the Duke of Richmond in 1525, which shows Henry did believe this illegitimate son could be heir, and Parliament helped this with the act of succession. But it wasn't really good enough. Unfortunately, on the 23rd of July, 1536, Henry Fitzroy died, so Henry's backup poem died with him. So, back to Jane. She was gentle and kind as a wife who followed the motto of bound to obey and serve. The perfect wife who made all of Henry's dreams come true by giving him a baby boy, Edward, on the 12th of October, 1537. But Jane was ill from the birth which had lasted three days. Ouch! She died two weeks later and Henry was devastated. He wore black for three months, didn't remarry for two years, and even though he is married three more times before he dies, it is Jane he's buried with, showing he really did love her. The powers of the Seymours didn't end with Jane. She became saint-like in Henry's eyes and her family benefited. During her life, Henry had made up with Princess Mary. Jane's brother was made Earl of Heart for days after Edward was born and the future king was put into the family's care for his upbringing. Now, there's one more wife who appears during this time we're looking at and that's Anne of Cleves. This wasn't a marriage of love or infatuation. This was political. Henry was pushed into remarrying by Cromwell and was limited in choice. He needed a Protestant princess to hold up his power. Henry was not the handsome athlete of his youth. The jousting injury had seen to that. He's now the overweight man we think of with a leg wound that never heals, gets pussy and stinks on his leg. Ew. Also, women didn't want to marry him. He might be king, but his wives so far haven't had a good deal. Cromwell finds him Anne of Cleves, gentle and obedient. She comes from a great European family who could help defend England against an invasion rumoured to be happening by Charles V and Francis I. She would enable Cromwell to make more religious changes and family factions in court wouldn't be an issue for him to fight with. But there was an issue. She was ugly. In Tudor times, women should be petite, and Anne was more curvaceous. In today's fashion, she'd be admired. Cromwell had Hans Holbein paint a flattering picture of her. He airbrushed the heck out of her. On the basis of the picture, Henry agreed to marry Anne, but when she arrived on seeing her, he cried, I like her not, and called her the Flanders Mare. She also didn't have the talents he admired in women, like singing or speaking English. Although he kept his promise and married her, by spring of 1540, the we wedding wasn't needed anymore. The threat of invasion had gone and Henry was granted an annulment on the ground and couldn't excite him, so there was no potential for children from her, if you get my drift. He was good to her, though. Had her known as the king's sister for the rest of her life and given nice houses and money, too. This marriage didn't end so well for Cromwell. Henry was furious with him, and it added f fuel to the fire of Cromwell's downfall. Behind this, the Duke of Norfolk had placed another niece in Henry's eyeline, the young and beautiful Catherine Howard, who would become Henry's fourth wife, and meet the same end as her cousin Anne Boleyn by being executed for adultery. The poor thing. So, in summary, four wives and three outcomes. Anne Boleyn starts out well, but no sons, and being naggy ends without a head, and the downfall of the Boleyn faction for a while. Jane Seymour was the shining star and bought Henry his son, the future Edward VI, but died breaking his heart while cementing the power of the Seymour family. Anne of Cleves was a marriage for political gain, arranged by Cromwell to establish a mainland Europe Protestant ally. It ended due to a lack of attraction. She was well thought of, but Cromwell suffers as a result. And then finally, Catherine Howard is able to bring the Boleyns back into the good books, but like her cousin, is eventually executed for adultery.